Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. In this installment, I'll be taking a look at an animated web series called Interface. The series just came to my attention a few weeks ago, and I was pleased to see a strange new independent project that I could really sink my teeth into. Now, here's one that I'm really going to emphasize that you should watch prior to listening to my whole spiel. The series consists of a handful of short animated videos, and I would imagine that it's an ongoing series. That is to say, it hasn't yet come to a conclusion. You can watch the videos on a YouTube channel called Umami, and while you're there, check out their other work as well, because this artist has a really unique style that I think my viewers will appreciate. As of the release of this here video, the series consists of 10 episodes. They generally tend to be a few minutes in length. Interface is remarkable for a number of reasons, foremost of which is its consistently melancholic tone. There's also a kind of grotesque realism to the artist's style that, when combined with the somewhat minimalistic animation, creates a surreal and otherworldly effect. I would place Interface in the realm of an artistic and literary genre known as cyberpunk. You might recall that in November of last year, I covered Blade Runner as well as its sequel, Blade Runner 2049. In that video, I did a little breakdown of cyberpunk and its general characteristics. You can watch that if you want a more detailed description of the genre, but for the purposes of this analysis, it would suffice to say that cyberpunk entails a juxtaposition between highly advanced technology and a radical breakdown in the social order of things. As is generally the case with works in the cyberpunk genre, one gets the sense that the world presented to us in Interphase is in some kind of disarray. We know almost nothing about the political order of this fictional universe, but we can perhaps deduce a few things based on bits of information doled out gradually over the course of these 10 episodes. We might well characterize Interface, the work, as a sort of Picaresque series of interactions between a man, whose name we eventually come to learn is Henrik, and an entity referred to as Mischief. Though there's also a larger narrative playing out, as evidenced by various sequences interspersed throughout the series pertaining to a company called Greetings Robotics Corporation. We know very little about Henrik, other than that he was born in 1910, and he doesn't seem to age in the way that other people do. There are various indications in the series that he's outlived his wife and daughter. This is perhaps best evidenced by the cryptic remarks of someone we might presume to be his daughter. When I join mom, should we wait for you? Mischief is the result of a failed government experiment in which some new technology was employed in an attempt to make military units, specifically in this case a naval ship, completely invisible to the enemy. But instead of becoming invisible, the entire ship was instantly teleported to New York City. Mischief is a former crew member of this vessel, and his human body was annihilated in the teleportation process. It seems as though he's manifested in another form, a shape-shifting clown-like monster, really a thing of nightmares. Though strangely, Mischief doesn't appear to be a hostile entity, at least not to Henrik, and we haven't really seen him use his shape-shifting abilities to hurt anyone. Onto the larger narrative at play in this series. In episode 3, the CEO of Greetings Robotics unveils a new product to the United Nations. If this presentation is any indication, it would appear that Interface takes place in an alternate reality in which some mysterious, world-changing phenomenon has taken place. The event, which we are told occurred in 1943, entails the emergence of some strange new force, referred to as cerebral electricity. The presenter relays that this force has somehow initiated a process by which ghost stories and myths literally come into being. One might guess that this is meant as a metaphor rather than a literal retelling of historic events. However, based on other scenes, it would seem that nightmarish beings have indeed literally come into being. On that note, it seems clear that the origin of mischief has something to do with this phenomenon, as his transformation is also said to have occurred in 1943. Now, in the process of studying this phenomenon, it would seem that Greetings Robotics has been able to harness this force, this cerebral electricity, in order to create a new product. It's a piece of highly advanced technology called Kami, short for 
Kinetic Autonomous Mechanical Interface. It stands to reason that this product, an interface, is what the series is named after. Now, the term interface can be defined as a point where two systems, subjects, organizations, etc., meet and interact. In reference to computer science, the term refers to a device or a program enabling a user to communicate with a computer. Based on this understanding of the term interface, it seems that the Kami unit is a tool that is meant to interact with something. But its purpose is not entirely clear, and what exactly it is meant to interact with is not explicitly stated. In addition to the Kami unit, it appears that Greetings Robotics has developed some kind of biotechnological airship, which we learn is called the Mechanical Saccharitis. It would also appear that the airship is piloted by a Kami unit. It's noted in Episode 3 that Greetings Robotics is working with the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee, and based on the commercial in Episode 8, it would seem that security is their primary focus. Although it's not entirely clear what they're fighting against, we never get a sense that enemy invaders present any kind of imminent threat. It raises the question, who is really in control here, the UN or this vast transnational corporation? Now that we've established some concrete plot points with respect to what's happening on the surface level of the work, let's dive into the subtext and explore the deeper thematic nature of the work. There is a distinct and gutting sense of hopelessness evoked throughout the series, but what is the precise nature of this hopelessness? We're presented with an alternate reality in which the apocalypse didn't quite take place in a manner we might expect it to. What did take place is not one major catastrophe per se, but rather a gradual transformation of humanity itself into something else, something unrecognizable. Visual motifs throughout the series appear to give some credence to the idea that there is indeed some kind of strange force at play in this alternate reality. The continual appearance of static as well as these strange shapes that pop in and out of existence in various sequences can perhaps be understood to represent the so-called cerebral electricity first referenced in episode 3. But you know, I'm far more interested in the question of what this cerebral electricity represents than what it actually is in the fictional universe of Interface. To that end, it is worth noting that the meditative experience of art is a prevalent theme throughout the series. And I think this might be a good starting point for our inquiry. So, on the topic of art, we've obviously got to talk about this scene. In episode 5, the entity known as Mischief takes Henrik to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and they look at a painting. It's a rather iconic scene known as the Son of Man, which also just happens to be the title of episode five. It's a self-portrait painted in 1964 by Rene Magritte. Mischief's comments in this scene would seem to indicate that the painting is relevant to Henrik insofar as it expresses a sort of frustration brought about by an obstacle, namely this pesky apple floating in front of the guy's face. As to what specifically is proving to be an obstacle in Henrik's life, well, that's not entirely clear, but based on the title, The Son of Man, we can possibly speculate that the image signifies what will come after humanity, the next phase in the course of human evolution. The problem is we can't possibly know what the man's face looks like from this perspective. And you know, I'd say that's kind of the point. In this series, the painting represents a kind of potentiality, an unknown variable that could have either wonderful or disastrous consequences. In light of the general tone of the series, it might be fair to say that disaster has won out. So how did this happen? I don't presume to know the particular circumstances, but there is some evidence to suggest that the scope of this series is nothing short of cosmic. Episode 7 begins with a narrator describing the origin of planet Earth and then the origin of life on our planet, loosely following Darwin's theory of evolution. Though the narrator ascribes a kind of will to the evolution of life, that would seem to indicate there's more going on here than mere chance. The narrator says that molecules, quote, strive to become more complex. You won't see this sort of talk in any science textbook, at least not in the literal sense, but it is evocative of certain strands of philosophical inquiry. The will to life, as described by Arthur Schopenhauer, is perhaps worth mentioning here. Schopenhauer conceived of the will to life as the inherent drive of all living things to, well, continue living. It's a drive that inveigles us into reproducing. 
It's that last part where human consciousness comes into play. A rather uh, cynical understanding of this process is that consciousness itself is just a means for humanity to continue reproducing. An elaborate ruse that heightens our chances of propagating the species. The self-consciousness of humans is often understood as distinct from the experience of other animals primarily because we have the ability to recognize the inevitability of our own eventual death, as well as the death of our loved ones. There are various philosophical responses to this line of thought. Pessimists tend to claim that human life is largely defined by the suffering we experience as a result of the stark impermanence of things. To be clear, this isn't something I believe per se, but I do think any worthwhile philosophical outlook must both acknowledge and combat this pessimistic outlook. One way to interpret Interface is to see it as a surreal and abstract depiction of a man haunted by the death of his family. In this context, it seems plausible that mischief is simply a manifestation of Henrik's guilt for having outlived his family. Whether or not this is true in the work itself, I can't really say at this point. But the emotional experience of guilt does seem to play a distinct role in Henrik's psyche. You may have heard the term survivor's guilt before. It's a term often used in reference to the guilt experienced by some of those who survived the Holocaust. Some felt as though they had done something wrong by surviving the experience when so many others did not. This is a fairly common experience for those who have lost loved ones in any traumatic context. So we might best understand these scenes with Henrik and Mischief as a sort of abstract meditation on the nature of survivor's guilt. That would seem to explain the underlying sense of melancholy evoked throughout the series. So too does Interface depict a strange reality in which technological advancements lead to the radical breakdown of conceptual boundaries between things and people. On that note, I want to discuss a concept known as deterritorialization. This concept was first conceived of in 1972 by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, a philosopher and a psychoanalyst, respectively, in Anti-Oedipus. It's the first part of a two-volume theoretical work called Capitalism and Schizophrenia, in which these two thinkers attempt to map out a materialist notion of psychiatry by exploring the relationship between desire and reality in capitalist society. Now, there are all sorts of psychoanalytic and philosophical associations with deterritorialization, but essentially the term refers to the manner in which subjects and objects become severed from their cultural associations in a particular place and time. In Interface, it seems as though the idea of monsters has been subject to an elaborate process of deterritorialization at least in relative terms. That is to say, the idea has been disembedded from its previous context. The Western notion of the monster as a particularized social concept in the 20th century is, of course, multifaceted. There are certainly campy movies and other items of pop culture that depict monsters as not strictly threatening, but in the world of interface, literal monsters have been commodified such that they are not frightening nor is there evidence to suggest they're even seen as grotesque in this fictional world. In fact, it's only when Mischief takes the form of a flower that he freaks out a little boy in the art museum. All previous associations with this cultural item have been severed, and the concept itself has been reintroduced as a part of the wealth accumulation process. What is perhaps most striking about this concept of deterritorialization in relation to the work Interface is the manner in which art and propaganda are intermingled into the subjective experience of Henrik, and by extension, the viewers, as evidenced by this Greetings Robotics commercial in Episode 8. The watchful eyes evokes a sort of uncanny, tyrannical presence, the likes of which is such a common trope in dystopian works that you might even think it's a bit too on the nose here in Interface. And sure, we could very well characterize this bit of lo-fi propaganda as an homage to Big Brother from the novel 1984, which is, at this point, a household name. It's so common that it borders on a cliché. The thing is, though, there's an unmistakable sort of avant-garde quality to the commercial that would seem to negate its very purpose. It's a kind of propaganda, but it's also experimental and trippy. So the message is not all that clear, which is not typical of propaganda. 
To be sure, the phrase secure beneath the watchful eyes sends a direct and unambiguous message. Greetings Robotics is keeping you safe, but the warped face behind these words betray its underlying message. The ever-shifting and at times distorted expression of the face conveys a sense of ambivalence. If we take this experience at face value, it is perhaps reasonable to speculate that the version of reality depicted in Interphase is one in which it is acceptable for propaganda to take on a sort of avant-garde quality. That is to say, the very concept of experimental art has become severed from culture and propaganda has assumed its, well, artistic qualities. It could very well be that art, or at least a current sense of art, rather than the idea of art in a museum, has been totally subsumed in a process not unlike a hostile corporate acquisition. Though in this case, it's a kind of conceptual acquisition that takes place within people's minds. It's certainly a disturbing thing to think that people can't tell the difference between art and propaganda. But what's even more troubling is the possibility that, in this world, they simply don't care. After all, there is a sort of cold medical curiosity to the way that the commercial is presented here in this hospital room. At the same time, it is entirely possible that this continually distorted face has a kind of hypnotic function on the public. It is, after all, similar to the face that appears under the mask of the Kami unit. This cultural subsuming of all things could very well be a function of Greetings Robotics products, the Kami unit. It is then perhaps even reasonable to think that this highly advanced device is working to control the masses through both surveillance and a kind of hypnotic brainwashing. The result is complacency, the complete and total pacification of the public in the face of what is quite obviously a corporate hellscape of a world. My analysis of this material is admittedly limited, considering it's an ongoing series. But I would say that the world shown to us in Interface at this point can be best understood as a sort of artistic extrapolation of current trends in technology and the radical social change, perhaps it would be better to say breakdown, that is brought about by said technology. Like all works in the realm of dystopian science fiction, Interface is a commentary on our place in the world. But more than that, it's an anxious fever dream about the nature of loss in a time of concentrated corporate power and rapid-paced technological and social change. As to where exactly this series will take us in the future, I do not know. But I, for one, am excited to see what comes next. I encourage you to continue watching, and if you're so inclined, maybe consider supporting this artist on Patreon. I'll have a link in the video description. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. If you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash Nightmare Masterclass. Any donation, large or small, would be highly appreciated. Thank you for watching, and good night.